This is really from a chapter um, that's my attempt to think about the 1801 Cane Ridge, Kentucky revival. It's a religious revival which sets off the Second Great Awakening. My service scholarship is early American studies. Um, but hopefully the, the, the reason why I'm interested in it will become clear. And um, I, I should just say it's a, it's, a, it's a talk, but it ends with three enumerated sections. So when I start counting off, you know that uh, relief is in sight. Okay, Jason Moore has recently urged us to consider the distinction between neoliberalism and neoliberalization. Can we distinguish the recent particularities of the post-1970s period as different from the general logistic of capitalist procedures? Almost unused as a term in the 20th century, neoliberalism has become in the last five years since the global economic crisis practically a standard key word to describe the current regime of accumulation. Thanks not least to David Harvey and Naomi Klein and the speakers at this conference, we have, I think, a synoptic familiarity with the term and commonsensical understanding of its maneuvers. Yet, does neoliberalism seem new only because it's the reception after the post-1970s retreat from class as a category of analysis? And is it in danger of becoming a quicksand term, um, something that signifies everything and nothing, much has happened with the keyword postmodernism. The question is, are there differentiable mini-periods, for instance, within neoliberalism from the 1970s to the current post-crisis continuation of austerity? Most historically informed criticism strives to define capitalist periodization by seeking to nominate exemplary features that differentiate one temporal phase and its associated cultural forms from another. Yet this emphasis on periodization has often come at the expense of an analysis into what Marx calls periodicity, the recurring features of capitalism throughout multiple cycles of social reproduction and value refluxes. So how can we balance the two, periodization and periodicity? A somewhat technical discussion may help cast light on this question. Um, and so I'm going to move into a part which will be boring to some of you because you already know it and befuddling to others because it will be so unfamiliar, so apologies for that. But I'm hoping to convince you the need to go through this kind of technical discussion near the end. Um, but I'm aware that it will look like a forest of trees, a thicket. Um, uh, this a technical discussion may help cast light on the question, which has been difficult to think through since Marx's expanded description of the multiple temporalities within the circuit of capital implies a term, what I call fixed labor power, that is nonetheless absent in his writing. It should be there, but it is not. If we provide this term, which ought to be present, some long-standing discussions about the operation of culture within capitalism, neoliberal or not, um, become newly clear and mutually useful. To invoke an older Althusserian school terminology, fixed labor power is the object for which the domain of cultural materialism has long been searching, and with its key can open up new doors and theoretical discussions. In volume one of Capital, Marx examines the sphere of production to detail the conditions of class struggle by using a simple model of capital circuit, MCM. Money is used to purchase commodities to be sold for resulting profit. On, the other, on one hand, a single turnover circuit, MCM, is treated in abstraction, on the other, Marx uses the confrontation within this single circuit to layer expanding phases of relatively homogenized history, the era of handiworks, um, the era of manufacture, and so on. Capital's second and third volumes switch perspectives to concentrate instead less on class struggle than on the conditions of infra-capitalist competition. To illustrate the texture of capitalist competition rather than bourgeois proletarian <laughs> conflict, or to use Foucauldian terms, to make the move from a study of discipline as cross-class struggle to governmentality as Foucault's concern for uh, capitalist competition. To illustrate the texture of capitalist competition, Marx invokes an expanded and more final version of capital circuit, which treats values transformation through its movements through three distinguishable spheres involving the productive labor pro process, commodity circulation, and money dealing capital. The formula for this circuit using money capital as the starting point is MCPCM. 
or, or money for commodities, uh, of labor power, um, and means of production, labor power designated by LP and means of production is MP, um, that are used, Marx says, as productive consumption by the capitalist of the commodities purchased to make a different commodity that will be sold for profit of enterprise. He treats these three figures or sub-circuits as configuring three different kinds of capital, money capital, productive capital, which is the focus of volume one, and commodity capital. Each circuit has different agents, agents which roughly correspond uh, for money capital as bankers, lenders, and investors, or what we might today call the financial services. Um, commodity capital involves merchants, retailers, wholesalers, distributors, that is to say those who do not produce commodities but make their profit by trafficking between markets, and the actual bosses of production capital. Um, and this is just the illustration many of you know from David Harvey's Limits to Capital, taken from uh, an earlier book by Desai. Uh, that's the circuit of money capital, that's productive capital, and that's um, commodity capital. These later volumes, that's say volumes two and three of Capital, examine space and time from a different viewpoint than the first volume, since they address the manner in which the tensions between capitals create mismatches between one circuit's ability to consume what another produces in order to produce what a third needs to consume and complete the turnover circuit. Capitalist crisis is not considered in the second and third volumes as strictly a matter of class struggle, which is volume one's theme, but as a matter of infra-capitalist competition and the devaluations resulting from the disarticulation of one circuit from the others a disjointedness propelled by the agents of every circuit's desire for autonomy and to leapfrog ahead of the others. Um, uh, uh, for each particular capitalist search for independence from the web of social capital is destructive of the overall capitalist system since it creates value destroying gaps of time and space, um, or what I call transformation rips of capital's manifolds, the manifolds being the overlapping uh, regions um, between the two circuits. Consequently, Marx argues that while the form of appearance, um, for instance, on the two-dimensional page or on the slide, makes it seem as if the circuits work sequentially, or what he says, nacheinander, one after another, one metamorphosing into the other, the reality is that they must also exist simultaneously, or what Marx calls nebenander, next to each other. While individual capitalists seek to limit these value inactive synoptic overlays, capital as a system requires the constant presence of reserves that can suture the gaps between the different circuits' needs for inputs, um, uh, gaps which might appear at multiple points within the circuit. Um, recently, David Harvey has been talking about the 17 contradictions of capital. Sounds like a dating manual. Um, and that would be, I think, one uh, example of these multiple sites of contradiction. There's not one contradiction within the system. It can erupt variously at, at, at these points with these transformation rips. Um, and so they have to, capital needs reserves. Each uh, circuit needs reserves. For money capital, there must be a financial reserve that can be borrowed, borrowed from to facilitate exchange. For commodity capital, there must be excess stock including raw materials and energy inputs to overcome supply shortages, and productive capitalists require a labor fund through surpluses usually achieved by the creation of an unemployed reserve army of labor. In volumes two and three, Marx distinguishes, uh, I'm sorry, I just wanted to quickly point out that the one problem with Harvey's pro uh, model, though, is that it's still preoccupied on value rather than price. Um, the value would be on the uh, the bottom, means of production and labor power. Let me just move on to that. Um, in volumes two and three, Marx distinguishes these purchases, though, as involving different temporal durations, depending upon whether they involve what he calls fixed or fluid capital. Fluid capital is often more known as circulating capital, but uh, uh, I think the fluid is more accurate to what Marx is trying to describe. The distinction between fixed and fluid capital is simply one of time. It's purely a temporal distinction. Fluid capital is entirely used up or consumed in a single act of commodity production. Nothing is left over as its value is entirely transformed within the metamorphosis of one commodity into another, um, for example, linen into a suit. Marx considers both the means of production, um, raw materials and energy inputs, 
and labor power as fluid capital, um, not least because capitalists conceptualize workers' labor time as simply another kind of object necessary to be purchased. Fixed capital, on the other hand, trickles value, decongealing bit by bit as fractions are made incrementally fluid, circuit by circuit, so that they will only be entirely consumed after many turnover circuits. Examples of fixed capital range from machinery, used many times before it depreciates or falls apart, to rented land, and implantations in the built environment, mainly involving transportation and communication networks. The fluid, on the other hand, has a temporality of presentness, while the fixed binds the past and the future as it extends through multiple cycles of value movements. Consequently, the fluid is analogous to periodization and the fixed to periodicity, since both pairs are distinct but interdependent. As many of you know, David Harvey has used this distinction between fluid and fixed means of production for his concept of the spatial fix. Let me just put that. For Harvey, the spatial fix is a tactic for capital to prevent a complete devalorization of capital from potential inactivity by allocating it to lower profit but longer term fixed capital by switching from one circuit to another, often by sinking into the fixed capital of land, the built environment, and foreign geographies. This tactic is both a response to the overproduction of excess capital by lowering a possible overheating system and a means to restore surplus value through investment into technology. When the working class uses its newfound class subjectivity to demand more rights, capital overcomes its reluctance to invest in fixed capital of new technology, but does so to create unemployment as a means of forcing wage reductions. Hence, one kind of reserve creates another. Fixed capital generates a reserve army of labor. In this way, capital has its own regulating invisible hand that seeks to transfer risk onto the backs of the working class and to transform infracapitalist competition to translate infracapitalist competition back into class struggle. And this, of course, is Marx's own attempt to reply to Smith's imagination of sentiment as the invisible hand of regulating the marketplace. This is Marx's um, argument about how the marketplace becomes regulated. The spatial fixing of capital has a second but equally important feature as new geographies are appropriated so that the marketplace can expand to relieve the pressures of the buildup of underused commodities or loan capital. As Ernst Mendel insists, spending on military equipment and personnel for imperialist adventures should be understood as a form of a spatial fix and as, as a form of originating, otherwise called primitive accumulation, that is the search to create fixed capital in new territories. Yet, because Marx constantly works through binary oppositions, formal versus real, absolute versus relative, constant versus variable, we should expect a fourth term to appear, but nonetheless which remains unmentioned by Marx. Um, this fourth term would appear alongside fluid means of production and fluid power on one side and fixed means of production, but uh, we don't have the category of fixed labor power. Um, that's an absence, it's a gap which ought to be there, but Marx doesn't address. So what might this category of fixed labor power entail? In one sense, this must be what Marx calls the consumption fund. All the materials that labor needs, but which capitalists do not provide to ensure their human survival long enough to sell their labor power again and initiate a new circuit of capital, food, clothing, shelter, healthcare, and educational training. The magnitude of this consumption fund matters since it affects the socially necessary labor time beyond which stands surplus value. These elements and the magnitude of the consumption fund varies historically and socially, but it, we might consider it absolute fixed labor power in the same way that Marx defines absolute surplus power as the external force of overwork that does not alter the internal relations of the production process that will deliver, such as uh, relative surplus will deliver. Instead, we might think of relative fixed labor power as going beyond the consumption fund to include everything that shapes class subjectivity, such as the social infrastructures responsible for the durability of class solidarity and subordination. This is the realm of Granchian hegemony, 
And merely to call it the sphere of social reproduction, I think vastly and incompletely captures its constant reformulations as it is made fluid and ultimately becomes used up in relations to emerging historical pressures. Um, for fixed labor power is the sphere, or relative fixed labor power, is the sphere in which class relations are composed and decomposed, where they decongeal into new forms. Given the links between the fixed and the fluid, that is to say where uh, uh, fluid labor power can be treated as fluid means of production, the presence of a spatial fix in the category of the means of production likewise suggests an analogous one in the category of labor power, what I call, after Harvey, a cultural fix. Just as the spatial fix ensures the continued production of social capital by creating a longer lasting reserve, so too is a cultural fix necessary to establish durable class relations and a longer lasting reserve of identities and subjectivities wherein capitalism can ensure that subjects will present themselves as proletarians beyond the isolated and discrete moment of the exchange of labor power for wages. So let me go back just to the circuit for a moment. Yep, there it is, there's, the, there's our circuit. Just as there's a constant tension of articulation between the fluid and the fixed, or what we might call the parole and lang of socioeconomic relations, so too is there a constant centripetal and centrifugal tension between the circuits. Although Marx never completed his proposed volume on credit and money dealing capital, enough commentary exists to indicate its role in rearticulating the spheres, um, these transformation rips between these three categories, by providing capitalists with loan capital to purchase necessary commodities for the next round of trade, even in advance of the realization of profit through the sale of their wares. Credit, in other words, overcomes transformation rips regardless of where they occur within the um, circuit of capital. Credit creates a dual temporality within capitalism as it separates out the time from, of loan repayment from the time of the commodities turnover completion cycle the time of debt collection from the time of sale. So capitalism is constructing a new sense of time formation through credit. That's one of credit's um, inventions. It has a, a kind of invention of temporality. Um, the former, that's to say loan time rather than sale time, amplifies social abstraction. Um, and Marx will call credit the most irrational form of capitalism since money dealing capital operates as if material commodities are entirely unnecessary. It's irrational because it never seeks to appear in the form of, of material commodity. It just simply works from money to money. Um, uh, money, capital trades money for money without the mediation of commodity production. What Marx calls this um, insane activity. Uh, insane is the word which he repeatedly refers to talk about credit relations. Um, this insane activity becomes amplified, he says, when, quote, debts appear as commodities in the mind of the banker. So the credit might seem um, itself to become a derivative commodity as credit is treated itself as a tradable commodity rather than a loan for an actual one. Um, and so the classic definition that most textbooks will say, as Jody pointed out yesterday, is that a derivative re refers to an underlying commodity which isn't true because in the contemporary uses of derivatives, it is instead presented as a means of commodita commoditizing risk. But uh, they, even that definition, I, th I would argue, is also not true because what derivatives are actually producing is they're not commoditizing risk, but that they act as a technique of determining who will be in or out of the new composition of fixed labor relations. That is to say, derivatives are a tactic um, for determining the composition of fixed labor relations and class, um, um, class um, organizations. Um, derivatives seem complex as a means of making money, um, but I would argue the re it's not a question of whether we can understand them or not, is that derivatives simply do not work. Um, I believe the derivatives are simply no more or less profitable than any other mechanism. Right? They do not actually create these uh, surpluses power. There are only three mechanisms in which der derivatives um, produce profit. Uh, one is the existence or uh, providing a disguise for criminal cartels over the systemic determinants, the LIBOR fixing scandal, 
Um, so the derivatives profit comes from criminality. The second is the offshoring, use of offshore accounts for tax avoidance, which makes it profitable. And lastly, derivatives, the main uh, factor who profits from derivatives are the transaction fees um, by banks. And if you're a uh, uh, watcher of, Dun of Cheadle's House of Lies, um, you know that the transaction fees are where the money is to be had. But derivatives, in my opinion, um, uh, are not simply complex, um, but they do not work at all. Um, the general use of credit, however, um, as a, a horizontal fix, that is to say something which goes horizontally through these circuits, to allow a disaggregating system to maintain forward movement has a knock-on and a particular effect. For money-dealing capitalists are conventionally allowed to hive off profit from productive capitalists through the paid interest on loans because they act as systemic regulators and guardians of social capital. That is to say, the guardians of the totality of capital within the system. Bankers are meant to deliver fiscal aid for distressed capitalists or have the authority to cut off life support for those capitalists whose continued presence might catalyze a larger crisis. And bankers' regulation is usually tightly interlaced with the state, as uh, Werner talked about, yeah, um, uh, which legitimizes the use of financial violence. Yet what happens um, when the administrators of irrational capital become tired of providing collective oversight and use their privileged place over capital for their own benefit? What happens when the state abets this retraction of supervision and abstracts it? Such a gesture of the verticalization of the previously horizontal when credit capital is used for private hoarding um, or what Mark Levine usefully called a rent-seeking coalition might well characterize what we call neoliberalism which involves the definition of linearism for me is the loss and degradation of the spatial fix as well as the tied loss of the capitalist fix. Okay, to come to a conclusion, what does this really mean for today's discussion? Three points. It's a common, one, it's a commonplace since the 1970s. Capitalism has left the Western working classes roadkill on the road to globalization. Um, what makes neoliberalism distinctive from prior capitalist reflexes what, may, what is new about this moment is that this same is increasingly true for the Western middle class, which is not simply facing a momentary downturn of stalled wealth accumulation, but a more general developmental crisis as the core of the capitalist world systems moves eastward to South and East Asia. In this new phase, business interests have sought a new class trophy partner, abandoning the Western bourgeoisie for the more vibrant East and South Asian nascent middle class. Global capital sees the Euro-American bourgeoisie as little more than the zombified walking dead, an object simply available for asset stripping of generationally accrued wealth by increasing the costs of those non-negotiable elements taken as defining inclusion within the middle class, home ownership, health education, health care, and pension um, security. In the crisis of neoliberalism, um, Dumanal and Levy have suggested we're now entering a time of shifting alignments as a result of this crisis between the business, middle, and working classes. Um, I'm just gonna jump over that second point, but such an example might be Occupy with its union, links of unions and college graduates. Um, Dumanal and Levy's argument can be read as saying that shifting cultural fixes have theoretical implications. Um, in that our theoretical models that were developed through the 1970s onward, namely semiotic theories of subjectivity, may be true for that period, but are increasingly less so um, for the moment. Lastly, what I'll come to the conclusion as, as to what we can take away from this, uh, the loss of the cultural fix and its possibilities. I wanna argue that we, have to need, we need to do this kind of theoretical work, albeit slightly dull, I admit, um, because I see Occupy as a dandelion movement a failure in its terms of composition, but a success as the winds of Occupy let its seeds float forward to new endeavors. Let me end with a manifesto prediction. We are in an analogous moment of 1963-1964. That is to say, I think we are four to five years away from a May 68 moment. Um, you don't need a weatherman to know which way the wind is blowing in Egypt, Turkey, Brazil, New York, London, and elsewhere. As teachers, we have a duty not only to lament the failures of the present, but more generally to prepare the ground for the incipient near future. Um, such an activity might help reconceptualize a new hegemony between labor and the university, not least by renewing the interrogation of our familiar Marxist texts. Thank you. <laughs>